Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Steve Austin, Washington Editor. Stephen Hansen, Director of Biopharma Intelligence. On today's podcast, BioCentury's second quarter financial markets preview. Is M&A like today's Prometheus deal the cure for the biotech bear market? plus the abortion drug controversy, and a look at what Gilead is building in oncology. Uh, you'll note that I did not mention AACR there. Uh, that's because we're going to have a special edition of BioCentury this week devoted solely to readouts and interesting tidbits from the conference. That will be with a few of our other colleagues, so look out for that later this week. Today's podcast is brought to you by BioCentury's 23rd Bioequity Europe Conference, taking place in Dublin, Ireland. We are expecting record attendance at this year's conference. Register today to meet 240 CEOs, 200 VCs, and many other decision makers from across the innovation ecosystem at the industry's premier CEO and investor conference. It's taking place in May, and you can learn more at bioequityeurope.com. All right, our second quarter financial markets preview finds that an unfavorable macroeconomic environment continues to dominate sentiment toward biotech, and cash reserves are running low. As our writer Edwin Zhang points out, the spring of 2023 still feels like winter. Nearly half of all NASDAQ listed biotechs have less than 18 months of cash. A little more than 20% of biotechs on NASDAQ are trading below a buck. And the banking crisis precipitated by what went down at SVB only added insult to injury. And this is against a backdrop of large fund outflows from biotech. Now, the first quarter saw fewer M&A deals than the previous 11 quarters. Of course, that very big CGIN takeout by Pfizer gave the quarter one of the bigger aggregate deal values in that time frame. Uh, today, we saw quite a big deal out of Merck buying Prometheus. Stephen, is this the sort of thing we need to get biotech out of the doldrums? Thanks, Jeff. I think it's one of probably, I was going to say, you, you went over a few of the numbers there, and, and none of the numbers really look great for biotech heading into the second quarter. And so I think at the moment, you know, the feedback I got from investors was really m and is probably one of the few places that you can look to right now with any expectation of kind of reversing sentiment for the sector. And so, uh, you know, I think that's where the, this Prometheus acquisition is. It's a step, obviously, in the right direction. And one of the things that they always point out is why M&A is so good is because it it shows that investors can make money. And I think Prometheus is a really good example of that. You know, investors made money when they announced their phase two data in December when it jumped over 100%. They clearly made money today when it was up 75%, you know, so that's a pretty big premium on something that was already considered to be a takeout target. And, you know, just looking back to when they did their IPO in November 2020, I mean, this is nearly a 10x on where they priced at their IPO. That's a pretty good example to hold out for folks to show them that you can invest here and you can make a really good return. I, I think, think we, one one is not enough though, is, is I think the issue. Right, so I was gonna say that I think it's sort of an, I look at this as a necessary but not sufficient kind of uh, scenario. Right. So, you know, we've talked a lot about data. You gotta have good data and they have good data. So not all data gets rewarded. Maybe not even all data gets rewarded as well as this. So I think it is maybe heartening to some people to see that with really good data, you can get, what did you say, a 75% premium <laughs> on, right. on yep. this? Um, and that there are buyers out there who are willing to pay a lot of money for it, but it's not going to help anybody who's got mediocre data. You know, I think, Stephen, what you're sort of saying is they're all pretty much late stage deals, right? So I don't know how much um, sucker this gives, so to speak, to companies who are earlier in development. 
That's that's true. And the other thing here is, you know, I think that 75% premium also points to the fact that pretty confident this was probably a very competitive process. But I think it also probably highlights the huge gap in what the market is doing in terms of valuation versus what farmers are thinking about in terms of valuing these programs. And so I think that's an interesting maybe way of, of approaching it, whether that leads to any sort of bump outside of anyone else in the TL1A sort of antibody space, you know, remains to be seen. But um, like I said, I think it's a, it's a good sort of marker for others to be able to, to look at and say, okay, you know, you can, can actually invest in this sector and, and make money, um, which not many people have done over the past two years, I would say. And I think we should also acknowledge that this particular product is against a new target, meaning that there isn't a product that is marketed against this target, but that it also opens up a wide range of indications. So it's not just this asset against that one indication that they're paying for. There's obviously a lot of potential in that. I think that's going to be an exciting space to watch as well. But Stephen, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, we we had the financial preview and the XBI and the IBB, the uh, biotech indexes, saw the largest outflows in the last five quarters. XBI losing over a billion dollars in 1Q23. February being the single worst month. Does that mean March got better? <laughs> You're more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, at this point, it's hard. You know, it's one of these situations, I think, where you can sort of say, well, you can be hopeful in saying, is there any place to go but up? Um, yeah, it, it's 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 rough out there. I mean, Jeff already quoted some of the numbers. And, I, you know, one of the other ones I think really stuck out to me was 60% of NASDAQ listed biotechs are now under 200 million, which is a number that sticks in my head because we've often had some of the specialists comment about sort of that 200, 250 million threshold as being important because if you're one of these really large mutual funds or really large funds, it's sort of a, an investment principle that you don't invest in biotechs below that amount because it's just, A, there's such little liquidity, so it's hard to get in and out of those stocks. And B, you don't want to make a $10 million investment and immediately own a controlling share or a 20% share of the company, right? So when you start getting down that low, it makes it hard for the big funds to get in, even if they wanted to. And right, obviously right now, they don't want to. But even if we were to reach a point where they did, it's hard to get them in. And so that just creates another little barrier, I think, for, for a lot of small caps where, I mean, frankly, there's already enough barriers in place for them to do well. So we need to continue the positive clinical data trend. I mean, everyone says data, data, data is important, which it is. I think we need to see a run of positive clinical data. I think the, the Acceleron IPO filing that we saw last week is interesting. It's probably one of the better placed, better positioned sort of IPO prospects, given that they're, they're late stage. They're just about to start of phase three. So they're in that sort of late stage bucket where I think people are a little more willing to take on risk, given that it's already somewhat clinically de-risked. How that does, I think, will be a very interesting marker to follow in terms of where sentiment is and how interested people are in biotech. And one last thing, Stephen, and we should acknowledge that our colleague Edwin Zhang, you know, wrote the quarterly preview this month in collaboration with you, of course. One thing you've been keeping an eye on that people are always very interested in is cash runway. So tell us, without being a total downer on the whole episode, um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the, what we should be looking at in terms of the cash runway. I think you look at unprofitable NASDAQ listed by a Yeah, we do. And, and that's, I think, understandably, it's just, as we've been following this quarter over quarter, it just you kind of, it's almost like a clock where you just sort of see it ticking down and ticking down. And now, you know, we've gotten to the point to where nearly 50% of companies have 18 months of cash or less. We're seeing that cash runway dwindle. And I think we're kind of starting to reach the point to where, yeah, I mean, we either need to reach a point to where the markets really open up and start to be more open to doing opportunistic follow-ons, or I think companies are really going to start having to crank the, the the wheels in terms of alternative financing ideas, because we're kind of getting to crunch time here, I think, for a lot of companies, unfortunately, um, you know, which I think is also the trigger why we're starting to see, and I think expect to see more of these um, M&A sort of transactions that sort of bring two companies together, where, they, where they're trying to not only merge sort of, you know, complementary pipelines, but really merge balance sheets. 
We're sort of talking about survival strategies to some degree, not just the big exactly. pharma takeouts is what you're, yeah. That's right. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, biotech, think, biotech deals. Yep. And I mean, I think what's interesting, just a final note on this, is that it's obviously not the first downturn. You know, there have been ones before and biotech comes back. It's very different. We've never had a downturn on the heels of a pandemic. I don't know that we've had one where we had a tailwind of so much funding to this degree going into the downturn. And at the same time, we've never had this degree of uh, innovation and, you know, number of products and really exciting opportunities. So I think there are a lot of people out there who sort of feel that this is an opportunity to separate the wheat from the chaff, perhaps, and that the really good innovation will still get funded. That's sort of what we hear a lot, certainly on the private side with VCs. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, the other thing I thought was interesting in a few of my conversations were just how this is the type of market where if you're an investor, this is where you can find your your home runs. I mean, you know, they behind someone point out, you know, this is where people were investing in pharma cyclics at one dollar, which ended up getting sold for, you know, 21 billion or where you, you know, find GenMab trading below a couple hundred million dollars and, you know, turns around to be a, you know, 25 billion dollar company. So the, this is also the market where you can you can really find those big winners. But it takes some bravery, I think, to uh, to do that. And it also takes, I think, the right kind of fund. You know, not every, not every fund in this type of market where you're potentially facing redemptions can go out and invest in highly illiquid public small caps or micro caps. So, yeah, I think we just we need to get a bit of momentum going here before I think we can start talking about a recovery. All righty, then uh, Edwin's piece up on biocentury.com. It's one of these uh, in-depth analysis decks that we have been doing. It's downloadable as well, so be sure to check that out. Let's turn to Mifepristone, a week that began with a ruling on the abortion drug in a Texas district court, found itself with the Supreme Court weighing in uh, late on Friday. Steve, we talked a bit about this on the pod last week. Take us through what happened last week and and what you learned. Well, so State of Play, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals partially overturned the Texas decision, but it did in a way that really doubles down on aspects of the ruling that former FDA attorneys and the biopharma industry say are most problematic. I think it's important to point out the fundamental issue isn't anyone saying that courts should have no role in judging FDA actions. But it's really that judicial oversight should be confined to issues other than scientific and medical issues where FDA has the expertise. And again, nobody's saying that FDA's decisions are uh, always right. People complain about them all the time. But I think that the idea that the courts are going to step in and um, substitute their judgment for FDA has everyone concerned who, who knows much about it. And this case is, is a good illustration of what happens when the courts step in and decide that they know more about science and medicine and, and frankly, about FDA law than, than FDA does. Steve, just walk us through the finding of the Fifth Circuit and then what the Supreme Court's role and play is here, because I think most people here have focused on specifically what it means for abortion access. But of course, what you're focusing on is what it means for the oversight of FDA. And so what did the Fifth Circuit do or not do, as the case may be, <laughs> in that regard? So, so what the Fifth Circuit did is they, in, in a way, they tried to come up with a compromise, but it, it doesn't actually make the situation any better, either for abortion drug access or for the bigger issues about the integrity of the drug regulation process. Uh, so the Fifth Circuit basically said, okay, well, the organizations, the individuals who were complaining about FDA's approval of Mifepristone, uh, it's too late for them to undo that. That was 23 years ago. But they said the changes that FDA made more recently in the label and in the REMS, that's the, uh, the risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, that those ones are not, uh, it's not too late to change those and uh, to challenge those and the court um, overturned them. So it said, basically, you know, you should roll everything back to the way it was in 2016. For one thing that's impossible or very difficult for the company, there's one company that manufactures this drug, Danco. 
this decision means that all of the drugs that they have out there on the market now are misbranded if the decision were to stay, if the Supreme Court didn't change it. So they would have to um, recall all the drugs that are on the market now, apply for a new label indication, get that approved, which takes some time, redistribute the drugs, and which, by the way, the um, Fifth Circuit also said you can't um, send drugs through the abortion drugs through the mail anymore. So what you're really saying is that the Fifth Circuit actually decided on what the indication should be. They decided on the label. Is that yeah, what that means? They, they, they did. And and the way that they did it was quite extraordinary. So, for example, they said that FDA made a mistake in, a, in allowing a modified REMS, that's this risk evaluation mitigation strategy, because it didn't require a controlled study comparing the old uh, conditions of use to the new conditions of use. Well, that's not in the statute, and it's not something that FDA typically does. So the Fifth Circuit just made up its own requirement there. It also criticized FDA for making safety-related determination in 2021 based on a lack of adverse event reports, when in fact the adverse event reporting requirements for the companies never changed. Uh, and then one of the things that, that the Fifth Circuit did also was it endorsed a really extraordinary theory of legal standing, that is the legal ability of someone to bring a, a suit like this. So what the uh, Texas court did and what the Fifth Circuit agreed is it said that a physician can bring a case by arguing that the drug that FDA approved has adverse effects and that that physician could theoretically in the future have to treat somebody who was harmed and has those adverse effects. So in that way, the physician is being harmed by that approval and has standing to sue. Well, if you think about it, then if that stands, if that's the, if that's the new standard, then um, any physician in the country would be able to sue FDA over any drug because all drugs have some kind of adverse effects and some physician somewhere might have to treat somebody who has that effect. That's just the beginning. There, there are a number of other issues that were in the decision. So you ask where it's going now. So the Supreme Court put a temporary hold on the um, fifth court decision. It's um, going to consider briefs that are going to be filed both by the FDA and by um, Danco and also by third parties. Uh, Pharma, the trade association, has filed a brief supporting FDA's authority and um, asking the Supreme Court to overturn um, the Fifth Circuit decision and the Texas District Court decision. So we should know on Wednesday what the Supreme Court is going to do. That's not going to be a final decision, most likely. They're going to do something um, that's going to send the case back in some form or another to uh, lower courts. And then we're going to see this thing kind of percolating through for some period of time. And it's likely to land back in the Supreme Court's lap, is it? Very, very likely. Very likely that in the end, the Supreme Court is going to deal with this. The parties to the suit all, I think, hope that they can get this thing through the system quickly enough that the Supreme Court will make a decision in its current term, which expires in July. If it doesn't, then there'll be some kind of decision that'll be percolating through all the way through to the next session of the Supreme Court, which starts in the fall. All right. Well, one you'll be following for us, Steve. You had three, four stories last week. They're up on biocentry.com. And there's a nice nav navigation bar at the top to guide you through um, Steve's many interesting conversations with folks uh, that are following the case, many of whom are former high-ranking FDA officials. And so uh, some, some good insights there. Gilead has been building an oncology franchise for more than a decade, notably via the $12 billion acquisition of Kite six years ago and its $21 billion takeout of Immunomedics. That was in 2020. The company has shown it can create a blockbuster from its CAR-T technology, but it has an ambitious goal of becoming a top 10 cancer company by the end of this decade. Simone, you recently spoke with CMO Murdad Parsi on the BioCentury show. That's a great conversation that listeners will want to check out on our sister podcast or our YouTube channel. And Stephen, you spoke with Bill Grossman, 
head of oncology at the Foster City based biotech. Tell me, uh, both of you, I don't know who wants to jump in first. Is Gilead now more a cancer company than its old bread and butter infectious disease company? I'll, I'll, I'll take that one, Jeff. And I'm going to say it's in the eye of the beholder. So there's no question that by sales, Gilead is an infectious disease company, right? That the HIV sales, HCV, and the other infectious disease sales basically swamp the oncology sales. If you look at growth, the increase in sales, that's largely in the oncology section and it's CAR T, as we've talked about before, product became a blockbuster. And then if you ask Gilead, as I asked my dad Parsi, he sort of said they're about a halfway on their journey to becoming the oncology company they want to be. He also talked about them becoming an, an infectious disease oncology and inflammation company. So just a couple more things, and then Stephen's going to chime in with his, because he's also spoken to, to folks there. For me, they are an oncology company if they're a major oncology player, right? I know that they have ambitions that Stephen is going to outline to us in a minute, but I think other companies will look at them and say, they're a really big player in CAR T. They've got Trodel V, which is an ADC. They have a TIGIT asset, which... Well, they and others are struggling with that target, should we say. So, <laughs> you know, so they, they have, I think, a, a, a footprint that establishes them as capable of delivering and advancing products in oncology. So if you're a biotech looking for a partner, yeah, Gilead's a player. But the other thing I thought was interesting was from a scientific perspective, both um, my dad Parsi and the folks that Stephen spoke to talked about these three branches or three scientific disciplines around which their oncology direction or franchise is being built. And so it's a quite a scientific approach. They're not really a mechanistic approach. They're not really just going, okay, I want ADCs or I want bispecifics, or I'm going to be just this. They, they've got sort of a scientific philosophy behind the assets that they want to build. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So Stephen, why don't you kind of take it from there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so the way Bill Grossman explained to me, I mean, they've basically got three biology pillars. One is um, immuno-oncology, similar to every other cancer company out there, it seems. Um, but that's sort of where Kite Pharma fits in and fills out a lot of that, as well as the deal they did with Arcus Biosenses, which is where they got access to the TIGIT program that you referenced, Simone, as well as a few others. And that is, you know, right now makes up the vast majority of their clinical pipeline. Uh, they've obviously got other stuff that they haven't disclosed yet preclinically that fit in some of the other buckets, but really the vast majority of their stuff is in that IO basket. The other two are intrinsic cell death, which is where Trodelvi, the ADC, fits in, uh, which you know they really do view as a an anchor asset. Um, you know, obviously one of the four commercial products that they have in cancer so far. And then their third um, biology area is uh, the tumor microenvironment. So this is where they have a CCR8. Uh, they also have uh, a couple of adenosine pathway programs that they categorize in that area. So, you know, the thing that I found quite interesting was, um, well, A, I guess how, how ambitious their ambitions are um, in the sense that they've got four products, but really only three are commercially meaningful. Uh, the two CAR-T programs and Tordalvi, all three of those are showing pretty, pretty good growth. But what they want to hit by 2030, uh, you know, Jeff referenced, you know, some of their targets. They want 20 approved products by 2030. That's going to take some work. And I think that's probably going to have to come outside of their existing, or it's going to have to be complemented with, uh, with some more BD from them. So there's definitely more building to come. And that was, you know, one of the points that I think Bill made was the fact that to his mind, um, so he joined just a couple of years ago and has helped finish what he said was sort of building the team. So he, he thinks they've got all the people, all the research teams, all the development teams, that they need for their oncology franchise. Now what they really need to do is he sort of termed kind of feed that engine with more pipeline programs. In particular, three areas within that intrinsic cell death bucket, you know, where, where the ADC sit. Why I thought was really interesting was he highlighted three areas that they don't have any clinical programs yet, which you can think of lots of small biotechs that, that fit into these, you know, around oncogenic drivers, around synthetic lethality, and around resistance mechanisms. 
those are areas that Gilead is is looking to get into, but doesn't have any clinical assets yet. And interestingly enough, when I was chatting with him, I was like, well, those all happen to also be areas where, at least currently, you know, the prevailing modalities are small molecules. So has IRA had any impact on, you know, on, on how you're thinking about that? And, you know, he was very staunchly saying, no, you know, the science is what's going to drive it. If they happen to all be small molecules, we're still going to pursue them. You know, that's not going to basically saying that the IRA was not going to deter them from pursuing what they thought was either going to be best in class or first in class medicines, even if they happen to be small molecules. So I think one of the things that for me is interesting, and you outline this in the um, story that we're going to be posting shortly, right, Stephen, is that the history of this, because, you know, it, it hasn't been a simple path for Gilead to get into oncology. They had some false starts, they had some deals. And I suppose the kite acquisition was a, a very big cornerstone or gave them a very big cornerstone. And it is interesting, as, especially as we talk about the Merck deal today, it is interesting to see how these deals and how trajectories of these sort of very large companies do change. And so Gilead's going to be an ongoing story. And I think there's a few other companies that are growing up and growing out. And when we start to see them adding on a whole new therapeutic area or discipline like that, it, it's certainly one to watch. It doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we can look back to, I believe it was 2011 was kind of one of the first sort of major-ish, you know, acquisitions that they did in, in, in cancer. And um, you're right. I mean, there were definitely several false starts there. And it, I think for me, you know, the kite deal kind of signified, you know, they had done a couple what you'd call bolt-on deals, right? Where it's a couple hundred million here, a couple hundred million there. Well, the Kite one was kind of finally, I think them kind of pushing all their chips in and saying, okay, you know, if we're going to do this, we should probably, we maybe need to go big here. And so that's what I sort of see as the real kind of real start to what, you know, what we see now is, as Gilead's um, oncology franchise. But um, yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see how this plays out. And I, I'm just very curious to see, you know, what other deals they end up adding because, you know, they've done at least 12 deals over the last just couple of years where they've outlaid, you know, more than Jeff outlined a couple of them, but they've outlaid more than 40 billion, you know, to help build out this pipeline. So it's a big investment. And, you know, they're obviously, you know, as we said, they're, they're looking for a big return. So. All right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting piece and uh, it, it'll be very cool to see what they end up building in oncology, especially given their legacy in uh, quite a few other disease areas. Well, coming up this Thursday on our sister podcast, The Century Show, Steve is speaking with Paul Stoffels, head of Galapagos, longtime top exec at J&J. &J. Tune in wherever you get your podcasts, on our website or on our YouTube channel. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. 